Welcome to the Level Asian Podcast. This is part two of our episode with Heavenly, owner of Bodhi Restaurant Bar. We hear about Heaven's struggles with identity around being mixed race and why retracing her family roots have become so important to her. We also chat about why Bodhi closed down, reflecting on the last 20 plus years and the plans coming up for the future. If you haven't listened to part one yet, make sure you hit pause and be sure to jump onto that episode first. Otherwise, enjoy part two. I sort of also want to go back to, you know, sort of being, you know, mixed race because I think um, that's super important. I mean, I can't, I can only relate as a third culture child, meaning, you know, um, being sort of Asian and then growing up in a Western society and then sort of combining the best of both. Mm -hmm. But from a third cultural perspective, yours is, you know, obviously quite different. It's almost fourth culture, Mm -hmm. if that makes any sense, right? There's a fourth dimension to it. Um, You know, like you you mentioned many times, you, you struggled with not knowing whether or not you were, well, you identified as Asian, um, and yet people were telling you you weren't or, yeah. you know, there was this whole narrative around that. Were there anything along this entire journey, right, from childhood right up until now that really helped you to um, be confident with who you are from an identity standpoint? And, you know, what was some of the – do you have any advice, I guess? Because I there's yeah. we, we've had a lot of feedback, um, you know, through socials about wanting to talk about this, which mm-hmm. is there are a lot of mixed race Asians who are really struggling with that. They don't feel Asian. They don't feel, you know, yes. sort of Caucasian or whichever other race, and they, they just don't know what to do in this We situation. have Kelsey on our team as well who's always – like we always have the conversation around maybe we could do talk about it on the podcast because there isn't enough representation yeah. either of people that speak out about mm. it as well. Yeah, look, growing up there, I didn't even meet a lot of other mixed kids, you know. I mean, I think you would have kids that would come out of sort of like, say, the Vietnam War that were mixed race or the Philippines, you know, which mixed with American soldiers and stuff. And I remember, I mean, I even have stories in my family the first time, you know, a a white uncle was brought into my great grandmother's house in Malaysia. She was horrified because all of a sudden there's this tall white Uh, Swedish uncle of mine. Um, And I think she got out a broom and just shoved him into the kitchen (laughs) because she was terrified that the neighbors would see this foreign white devil, you know, so I've kind of got very interesting stories from that period. You know, and then also I think when I was presented to my great-grandmother, I mean, my mum always tells me the story that the first time she brought me home, my great-grandmother was like, oh, my God, you know, what, what are we doing with this half-caste kid? Mm. You know, a kid that's been born out of wedlock, that's half-white, like this is just shame upon yeah. our family uh-huh. sort of thing. And my mum kind of just handed me to her. I was just a baby, so I don't remember these. My mum just handed her to me, I handed me to her, and just left me with her for a couple of days and went off and did something else to go and visit school <laughs> friends or something. Oh, my God. Um, and so so my great grandma's like, what am I going to do with this baby? And and but I'm a baby and I'm innocent, you yeah. know. And so she just was like, I'm just going to love it, and that's what she did. And so I had a very close relationship with my great grandparents, and with my grandparents. Mm. Um, and then, you know, in regards to sort of, I guess what you were saying, mm. with sort of how do how do we help those that have got that sort of mixed cultural heritage? I probably say this: it is because of your differences that you will be celebrated Mm -hmm. despite not realizing it at the time. And that was something I didn't realize at the time. Like I didn't fit in, you know, I'm not Chinese, I'm not white, what what do I do sort of thing. It is because of those differences that I succeeded in what it was that I did as a business Mm -hmm. and I will continue to succeed moving forward because I have a unique view on Mm -hmm. the world and I can combine sort of these, you know, two amazing cultures and put something together that is, you know, um, is beautiful sort of thing. So I think – you know, celebrate the things that make you different. Um, and I know it's hard because there are, it's sometimes hard to meet other people. I'll tell you one story. I met, I did meet this other mixed race girl when I was younger. Um, and I remember going, oh, yes, yeah, somebody else like me. You know, I think I must have been late, nine, eight, nine, ten, or something like that. She didn't want to have anything to do with me right, yeah. at all. And at the time I was incredibly hurt by that because I thought, hey, we're, we're the same sort of thing. Um, it was years later I bumped into her and we had a conversation mm-hmm. about this. And I was like, I felt very rejected by you when we were kids. You know, we happened to go to the same school for a short period of time. And she said to me, I was just trying to survive, honey. Mm. You know, I couldn't worry about you. I could I could barely survive She's on my own. She was fending for herself. Right. 
And I didn't recognize that at the time, you know, mm. um, and I too was just trying to survive. So recognizing that we are all just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. We all have unique stories. Um, we're all different in different ways and we have to be willing to listen, to be there, to celebrate each other's differences. And that's going to be what makes you know, Australia successful as a culture mm. um, and your differences are what's going to make you successful later in life. Mm. Those things that you, um, that were your handicaps growing up or that you felt were your handicaps growing up, like not belonging, those will be the things that will actually um, make you more successful down the track for yeah. other people. Yeah. You think lean into the strengths, right? Mm. And um, what makes you unique. I remember my mom growing up, she, she really, beat it into my brother and I mm. about the importance of your mother tongue yep. and yeah. maintaining that. And I didn't get it at the time. I was just like, no, I don't need to learn it. When am I going to use Mandarin? Um, and and I, I thank her now for really um, making sure that I at least maintained it. And even though I've got a vocabulary, probably like a nine-year-old right now, but I can still, you know, like <laughs> linguistically be able yeah. to um, go to back to China or Taiwan or even Malaysia and just be, mm. you know, well-versed in conversation and mm. get around like a local. Um, and had I dropped that and, you know, seeing my, actually seeing ironically, I sort of see my brother who's four years younger than I am. Um, there wasn't that um, emphasis as much. So he, from a Mandarin perspective, really? really could not, I mean, he can still speak, but certainly not at probably the same level as I did. And um, I, I feel when you were talking about that, that's the exact thing that I feel like whilst not necessarily from a mixed race perspective, but if you, if you, you don't realize what you have until you need it. Yep. And um, the world changes, the world moves into, um, you know, particularly around globalization now and how, you know, travel is, I mean, you know, pre-pandemic and even now that um, I wouldn't have been afforded the experiences and some of the um, opportunities had it not been for the fact that, you know, I yeah. can speak the language and, you know, do all the things I can do being an Asian or a third culture kid basically in this country as well. So I feel like you're saying the same thing. hundred percent. I mean, it's the things that you're fed at a young age or any age that will decide who and what you are going to be later on in right. life. Yeah. Right. So if you feed yourself, you know, crap you know mm. if, you, if you don't okay let me put it to you another way you know if you don't look after your body if you don't exercise you will pay for that later on in life mm -hmm. right with your health and your agility and so mm. forth yep. if you're not feeding your soul with you know positivity and and good sort of information you know later on in life or surrounding yourself with good people later on in life you know that that will show yeah um and if you are learning and broadening your knowledge whether it's the language side of things, whether it's your cultural side of things, all of that later on will come back up and will feed who you are later. Mm. Uh, and that's a great thing, you know, mm. as much as we hate it when we, I don't know if, did any of you go to Asian Chinese school? Yeah. Yep. Saturday school. <laughs> Saturday, yeah. Saturday school yeah. near Central Station, I think it was where I had to go. And I was just like, I hate this. I hate this. Like, <laughs> what am I doing? I can't stand this. Why am I giving up my weekends? All the other kids are having fun and mm -hmm. I got to give up my weekends to go to Chinese school. Mm. Um, you know, but those sacrifices that I made have sort of helped me later on in life. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, those things are really good things to do and to have. Definitely. As much as you hate it growing up, it mm -hmm. actually is amazing once you yeah. are older and you're able to embrace it. But yeah. even from the Asian side of things, and I, we've had many conversations, and I remember we were a bunch of, we were talking about this, and, you know, you, you sort of want to go back and actually trace your roots as well, yes. which I was super excited to hear about that. Yes. Um, as, a, as just a, a journey, right, because I am now at a age where I'm very interested in doing the same thing. But, you know, particularly in your situation, um, and, and I think there are many families like that, but my family is probably not so much, is that you've, you've got so many countries that your family sort of had footprints yeah. in. You know, you talk about Malaysia, Taiwan, obviously mainland China and, um, and what have you. Everywhere. Everywhere, Everywhere, right? Everywhere. So how do you, I'm just like, I don't even know where to start with this, but it's really just like, like where do you start if you trace back your roots? You know? I like to say, because my family's surname is Huang, W-H-O-N-G, not W-O-N-G. Oh, it's the same, That's, is it? Is it the same as you? Yeah. Oh, really? I've yeah, never yeah, met yeah. somebody else who's a W-H-O-N-G. W-H-O-N-G. Oh. No, no, so that's different. So yeah. I'm just going to say, I was like, oh, I heard um, H H yeah, yeah. H-O-N-G um, and I was like. No, oh. well, later, I'll write the character later. Okay, so we'll maybe it's the same character, we'll see, we'll find out. Um, I, f I always like to say there's a Wong in every country <laughs> kind of thing. I'm yeah. really spread out everywhere. Uh, and I'm always discovering new relatives and stuff. Or well, my mum will suddenly out of the blue come out and say, oh, you know, like, 
you know, we have a cousin, long lost cousin that works for NASA. I'm like, really? How did you That's find crazy. out? I don't know. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, somewhere. Yeah, there's somebody who works for the president of the United States. What? Really? <laughs> you know? Yes, we were the first people to do this. Really? <laughs> sort of thing. How did you find, how did you find that yeah. out? I don't know how they find this information mm-hmm. out, but they do. I had a really interesting experience when I was younger. Trace, actually, I did a bit of tracing already of my family tree. So, from what I, my understanding is, my grandfather um, was, so my great grandfather left China to go to Malaysia, as many people mm-hmm. did back yep. then, um, and worked on like the rubber plantations. Mm-hmm. And then my grandfather, my grandfather was a very small child. And I think at the age of around three, he was sent on a ship to, f- to join my great grandparents oh. in Malaysia. And there's a great, great, great uncle of mine who actually carried him down to the, you know, ship to to send him over. And I actually found him years later in China. So my granddad had not been back to China since he was three. You know, all he had known was Malaysia, really. And I think I was in my teens the first time I went to China. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second time I said, I've got to take my granddad with me because he had never been back. So I took him back on a trip. I think it was like early 20s uh-huh. when we went back um, and it was an incredibly emotional journey. It was just fantastic. We actually went back to the village where this great, great, great uncle of mine lived and we found so many relatives in this village. It was a remote village in Fuzhou up in the mountains and it was called Yu, which means black oil. Okay. And it was a very fertile sort of rice paddy sort of land. Mountains, river, I mean, it was stunning. There was... I mean, I think they'd only just gotten some electricity the first time I went yeah. there. Um, you know, they were still wearing the communist sort of. Oh, was this during the nineties, early two thousands? Oh gosh, you're asking me to remember now. <laughs> so um, I would have been. Let me just do the maths. So seventy five, eighty five, ninety five. 1995, wow. Around 94, nine, oh, maybe even 1993. Yeah, because I'm just trying to contextualize period. China at that time. Yeah, China yeah. went through such a rapid growth that 95, so it was much. still very agrarian. Yes, it would have been mm. sometime. It would have been sometime in the very oh, early, in the early 90s, somewhere okay. between 1990 and 1995 that mm. we went back okay. there. And it was just you and your grandfather? It was me. My, the sec, this was our second trip. So it was the second trip was my, my mom, myself, my granddad, and my youngest aunt. Okay. Um, and I got up to some trouble when I was in China. Oh. It was so much fun. So we went back. We, we went back to this village. That was the second time I'd been to that village uh, and took granddad with us. And it was, like I said, an amazing experience. Mm-hmm. I have some really funny memories of it, though. Like, like they didn't have toilets. It was yeah. like a pit in the ground with the wooden <laughs> planks, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of thing mm-hmm. out in public. And because we were foreigners, mm-hmm. you couldn't go to the toilet in privacy. Like anytime you wanted to go to the bathroom – 50 little Asian kids <laughs> yeah. would follow you to the toilet and there was like a a wooden door that didn't touch the ground and didn't go up higher than your oh. neck. So it kind of was like, you know, just, covered just you. covering this and you'd have to squat to go to the toilet on this thing and they're all just standing there watching you going, do do foreign devils go to the toilet the same way that we do? <laughs> so, you know, I started getting very nervous about going to the bathroom and I'd have to sort of take a torch and go out at night time when mm. I think no one else was around. Yeah. And they'd have these massive barrels in the bed in the bedrooms that you would go to the toilet in, you know, and they would then use mm-hmm. all of this stuff to go and fertilize the plants yep. and stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was really rural. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do remember one of my cousins took me out into the middle of nowhere to this rice paddy and they had set up with what little electricity and a generator that they had. I think it was a generator. They had set up a couple of these colored lights and there was a like there was this parquet little floor thing, which wasn't very steady, and they were break dancing on it. What? Like doing Michael Jackson. No, break dancing was a thing in ninety five. Oh, no, they were doing. They were doing Michael Jackson. Moves. Where, where? How did they? I mean, mind get the influence of it. I don't know, but they were doing dance moves, and I remember not a lot of them. It was only two or three of us. Yeah. You know, I was like. What the hell is going on here? I mean, and there's nothing there, right? Yeah. But somehow they had sort of been influenced. And it was. It was Michael Jackson moonwalking. That's mm-hmm. what it was at the time. I was like, wow, even in, in rural China. Yeah. Um, but I have some fantastic stories about that. Well, how did your back. grandfather react going back to China? This was the oh, first time he back mm, since he was three? Since he had been back. It was his first trip. There was – I remember when we took him to the room to meet that great, great uncle mm. of mine. And they just – both of them just – broke down in tears and cried and I couldn't I mean the 
everybody, the whole room was crying. I mean, right. it was like the long lost son mm. yeah. had come back finally, you know, um, and the it, it made you realize the sacrifices that the family had made to get to Malaysia. And then the sacrifices my grandmother had made to make sure my mum was the first English educated child and sent away from home at seven. And then the sacrifices my mum made to come to Australia. And, the, you know, like that moment for me connected so many dots. Yes. And it made me go, wow, you know, if it wasn't for all of these people that sacrificed so much of not only themselves, um, but things that were important to them, you know, connection and family yeah. and each other and stuff. Like, how do you send a small child away, mm. you know yeah. what I mean, at three yeah. on a boat yeah, by like themselves? It's unfathomable in this day yeah. and age, right? You know, yeah. I couldn't even send my kid to daycare <laughs> yeah. for the first time, you know, yeah. for, for six hours um, sort of thing. So how do you send a kid to, to do this migration route on their own? And hope that they come and back. And hope that they come back. But that's it. It's hope. Yeah. You know, it's hope and it's dreams and it's, it's a desire to do better for not only mm. yourself but for the next year generation mm. and the generation after that and that that person will then come back and mm. you know be able to share you know that success yeah it's, it's so very moving. raw yeah. yeah like i was i think mm. back to uh going back and and i used to go back every year and i don't mm. think i fully appreciated going back and seeing relatives until i was um, probably much older, like 17, 18. Yeah. I had, you know, I don't know. I don't know what it is. You don't get is. it when you're a yeah, kid. you just don't mm -hmm. get it. And, um, and going back and then being taken around to see where my parents grew up, yeah. you know, in the dormitories of, you know, the schools, because they were both teachers, um, right through to all the extended friends and families that you meet. Um, and people talk to me as if they've known me like my entire life and I have no recollection because I was a child, but right? Know of you. But they do know of you. They, t they tell stories and, and they follow your journey. Exactly. Yeah. And it wasn't until then that I, I felt, I don't know. It was a weird, it was a weird feeling because I felt, I felt a bit alone in Australia. Cause I was like, Oh, so this is what truly what like having a collective community and family yeah. felt like, you know, and like Asian, you know, hospitality at its mm. sort of highest level. Mm. Um, but at the same time, it was like, I was, I was also very happy the fact that I, you know, my family chose to come to Australia because seeing sort of, and particularly this was same, like during the late nineties, early two thousands, seeing the quality of life over there yeah. compared to what we had here. Ah, phenomenally grateful for what we have here. Right. Although quality of life is fantastic there. So it was just, there's all this, like this, it's very mixed emotions. Like, you know, that period I remember going back because. Um, it's humbling. Yeah. It's just, mm. and, and it was also. Um, the sacrifices, like you said, you know, like thinking about my dad coming out to Australia before I was born. So he never, I never met my dad, you know, until I was two and a half years old. So it was just, wow. you know, you talk about sacrifice. I was like, hundred percent resonate with that stuff because these are the things that in this day and age, you don't think about, you're just like, mm -hmm. that's not even a choice. It's just like, it's a know. very Asian thing as well. I think it's something a lot of Western families don't experience, you know, mm -hmm. 18, you're out of the house. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. kind of the Australian mentality in a lot of households, but I think the culture, the Chinese culture, because it is so family orientated, um, once you understand it and get into it when you're a little older, you start to see these connections and you start, you know, putting the dots together and realizing that, you know, each small thing has played a role in mm. where I am today mm -hmm. sort of thing. And if it wasn't for those things, I wouldn't have what I have today. I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have the opportunities. But I do have to ask you something. What I have noticed in my family, though, mm. is as my, say, mum's generation has gotten older, they are now flipping, like, they were very, like, we got to go to the West, we got to go to the West. They're now flipping back to China. The East is better. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like, they've, yeah. uh, are you finding that in your family? My, my dad, I remember years ago, he Patriot. was. Patriot. Yeah, like, <laughs> yes. He was so about Australia, like, you know, when I got. Well, opportunity. Exactly. And, yeah. Like, you've, you've got it so lucky here. Now, like, he's scrolling through WeChat every night. He's like, look how good China <laughs> is. Like, I'm like, Dad, what are you talking about? <laughs> my mum and a couple of my aunts and uncles probably one or two of them are going through that at the moment where mm. they're just, they've idealized China now yep. to mm. where it's this great and incredible nation and life would be better in China because there's a sense of value and family and mm. you guys have lost all of this tradition that yeah. we had yeah. and so forth. And I'm like, mom, you wouldn't survive a day in China. <laughs> right? Like, Let's yeah. be honest, you yeah. know, like, come on, you would not survive a, a, you know, a week or a month, a, a holiday, fine, but living there, 
very different. You've lived, yeah. you've been, you know, living in the sort of country here. I, I think long. it's because, and I was talking, actually, I was talking to my dad about this exact thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he, he, it turned into a history lesson because he's a bit of a, he's a bit of a romanticist when it comes mm -hmm. to history as well. And, um, you know, the, the thing was just this sort of notion and anyone who sort of understands Chinese history will know it's sort of that sort of period of shame. And that mm. was when, you know, China was getting invaded by Japan and, you know, like Hong Kong got annexed by the British and all this sort of stuff. Right. And it was just like China, China was like the the country that was bullied on the world yeah. stage for a very long time. I got kicked around. And got mm. kicked around. And so if you were a Chinese during that period, which our parents were, um, you you almost like it was like a identity thing. It's like you didn't want anything to do it, and so there was that sort of big wave of migration going out to other countries because of the revolution and mm -hmm. things like that. And now thinking back, I think you know now that China is very prosperous and doing particularly well, and people look at China from an, a, a lens of envy. Mm. Um, there's a lot of pride now, mm -hmm. I think, for our parents, and yeah. particularly proud of being Chinese because now you're like, well everyone's now looking at us. We're on yep. the world stage and everyone's staring mm. at us instead of the other way around mm -hmm. as well. And it was funny, I was talking to um, Jae Yung Lo, who was, um, I guess, on the podcast last week and, you know, big basketball head. And we went to um, the Women's Basketball World Cup and um, China was playing against the US. And I, I funally felt a very interesting sense of pride sitting there with really? my dad. And he, he did too, even though he didn't say anything, I could feel it um, when the national anthem was playing. And wow. it was just like 80% of the crowd was Chinese like very vocally singing the national anthem. It was a wow. very patriotic moment. And, um, you know, I guess sort of to like round it all back, it was just, I think a lot of Chinese now are particularly proud about what their country is achieving. And they it's, should be. Yeah. They should be. Uh, but I think you have to also be careful of not falling into the trap of China can do no wrong. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, which some of that generation are starting you to You turn believe. a blind eye to. You're turning a blind eye. Because I said this to my mum the other day. I said, because she's, she's quite critical of the West now and quite pro-China, which mm. is fine. Everyone's, you know, got their own opinion on things. Um, and I said to her, give me three criticisms of China. And she couldn't come up with any of them. I said, mm. that's the problem, mm -hmm. that you're un unable. I can criticize three things about the Western culture and I can criticize three things about mm. the Asian culture off the top of my head. Mm. And the fact that you can't criticize anything shows that you are too kind of, yep. you know, bought into this sort of yep. narrative of – um, and, and I also said to her, you, you know, you've got to be careful as well of not playing the victim, mm -hmm. you know, because we do have such a complicated Chinese history. And this is not to take anything away from that, by the way. You know, I, I definitely feel like I have ties of what my uncles and aunts went through with the Japanese occupation mm -hmm. in Malaysia. Like we were put in, you know, they were put in, you know, sweat boxes in the middle of the jungle. Yeah. We lost family members because God. of what happened over there. Um, you know, my great, my grandfather sort of had to run into the jungle to escape the Japanese, all of that kind of stuff. So I'm not taking anything away from that because it has deeply, deeply impacted our family. And there has been, um, generational trauma from that. Mm. But at the same time, I'm not going to play a victim to past traumas for the yeah. rest of my life. I'm yes. going to learn from it, but I'm going to judge people on how they treat me today, mm. right? I'm not going to blame every Japanese person that I see for, right. yeah. for what happened. I'm exactly. judging you based on our relationship today, your mentality and your, your, your thinking today. Times move forward. You have to move forward. You have to let go. I had a lot of trauma growing up as a kid in my family, uh, at least I felt I did. And I blamed, you know, my mom for a lot of things growing up. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't all her fault, it was situational. You know, she had a really tough time herself. And I remember I had an incident that happened, I think I was about 17 years of age. Um, and my grandmother had passed away. My grandmother was like my mother. Mm. She was the one that showed me true love and just nothing. She was my soft place to land. She was my in my mind, she was my mother, you yeah. know, and my mom was this working parent that came in and mm. scolded me and, you know, maybe financially supported us. But, I, you know, you didn't get that when you were a kid. You didn't quite understand it. Um, but she was the disciplinarian and, and mm. she herself had so much trauma in her own life that that kind of got passed on. So I had a very difficult relationship with her. But I remember having a moment. My grandmother had passed away and I went out to her grave and I was sitting out there. And, uh, and it was in the middle of the night, you know, cause I was working hospitality mm. hours. So you felt a bit lost. You mm. would kind of just. So you'd knock off and then. You'd knock off and you'd go down yeah. and sort of have your moment. And I remember just having this aha moment where I was like, am I going to be a victim to everything? Am I going to pay the price for th the things that my mom's gone through, what she puts me through? You know, I hate the way my mom's treating me. I'm, 
you know, she's accusing me of not being Chinese enough. She's accusing me of being too Westernized. I don't fit in all of this kind of stuff. And, mm. you know, we've got a combative relationship or am I going to take control of my life from this point forward? If I am happy, it is going to be because of me. If I am unhappy, it's going to be because I allow it. I allow that stoic, person yeah. to affect me. Mm. I don't know how this thought process came about, but it, it came about at a very early age. And that started my journey of forgiveness, mm. right? Okay. Mm. So for me to move forward, I now have to forgive. I have to try and understand the generational trauma of what my mom is putting me through, of what my grandparents went through, um, the historical stuff as well, culturally, mm -hmm. um, and the complicated relationships of having an Asian mother in a Western society. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, I have to try and understand it, understand where she's coming from. And then I have to try and, I don't have to forget it, but I have to try and learn to forgive it mm -hmm. or at least not allow it to control me. Mm. Sort of thing. How's and your relationship with your mom now? Good. Yeah. It's good. I mean, it, you know, I've learned the methods on how to deal with yes. it in the best way yep. possible. You know, yep. I've built strategies over time. Every now and again, she might get a, a chink un <laughs> under the, the armor sort yeah. of thing. And it just kind of like, oh, that one hurt mom. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sort of thing. Um, because my mom is an incredibly complicated character. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say she's eccentric. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people don't understand her. Like she's very loved or she's very hated, but I think she's also very misunderstood. Yes. Mm. Um, and it's only once you try and understand her trauma and her background and her history and who she is as a person that you start to go, okay, well, I understand you better as a person. I'm not going to bite at the things yeah. that you say. Because mm. Chinese parents are very critical, right? Yes. Yeah. Very, very critical. You got 90 on a test. Why did you get 90? How come <laughs> Where's that, the that's 10%? a beat? Yeah. Why didn't you get 100? Yeah. Hmm? You know, the no, well done, son, well done, you know, or yeah. good job to your daughter. You know, they mm. don't do that. It's not an I love you culture, mm. right? They don't say, oh, I love you, sweetie. How mm -hmm. are you today? Do you have a good day? Mm. You they know? don't ask about your day. They don't ask about your day. You don't come home from school or work and they say, how was everything today? Mm. My mom didn't hug me as a small child. My grandparents didn't say I love you. Mm. You know, they showed love through food, mm -hmm. which is probably part of why I'm so passionate about what I do because that's part of my love language. They put the most precious and delicate morsels on your plate. Yeah. If you had a meal with your grandparents, which I often did because yeah. mum wasn't around, they had gone through starvation and war and there was no food and all of that kind of stuff. So we would sit down in a fam as a family and eat. You'd have to call your grandparents mm -hmm. to come and eat first because that was manners. Mm -hmm. yeah. You couldn't start until they did, mm -hmm. you know, and then they would sit down. My grandma would eat separately because she didn't want to eat with us. So the grandkids would sit down first. We'd call granddad, grandma. Mum wouldn't be there. She would be working. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'd sit down sometimes grandma would join us but she or he would pick out the best pieces of meat or you know whatever yep. it was that, that was cooked at the time because mm -hmm. we ate meat back then and they would put that on your plate and mm -hmm. that's how they told you that they loved you they gave you the best of everything mm -hmm. and later on in life as my grandparents aged i started to do the same thing back oh. then right like i go to the restaurant i would pick out the best yum chart food for granddad yeah. or the best morsels or the part of the whatever he likes the most and put it on his plate yeah. sort of thing so that was how they expressed that they cared we didn't grow up with that sort of well done, you know, kind of mentality. Exactly. I didn't realize that I do that for my parents when we go out and eat now because I know that my dad used to do that for me and like that he does that. Well, my both my parents do that for my siblings. Now. Yeah, it's love I've, and respect. Yeah, I've just realized that whenever we go out and eat, it's always I always pick out the dishes first mm. or even my mum still has this very strict rule where we can't eat until dad is sitting at the table yeah. because he's out working all the time. Like he doesn't, he only has what one or two days off in the year. And so coming home, sitting down for dinner is the only time that all of the family can sit together and spend half an hour. Mm. And obviously my siblings will be getting older one day and they might not appreciate it now, but like me being a little bit older, I can appreciate what, it means, especially growing up with it. And so I know that they will appreciate it later on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, food's been that thing that connects all of us, right? Yes. Like at the end of the day, like mm. it's, it's a language that needs no translator. If that makes sense. Yeah. Good universal food, language. Food. It's right? a universal yes. yeah. language. It's like music. Yeah. Right. Mm. Um, it's a universal language. So I, rem I, I recognize that every major event in my family has had food as another almost another character, mm -hmm. you know, like in some movies you'll see like Sex in the City and New York is one character. Yeah. For Asians, I think food is another character. Um, 
and it, it sort of has always brought us together. Every good occasion, bad occasion. If it's a funeral, there's still food involved, yes. right? If it's a graduation celebration, there's food. still food involved. Haven't seen family. Let's go for yum cha lunch on a mm. Sunday. We take the whole family. You know, I haven't. Oh, I haven't seen this cousin for whatever. <laughs> Let's go but, out and eat. <laughs> but we go and eat. So food's always played a really important role. And so I think that sharing of that food mm. from either a parent to a child or a grandparent to a child or a child back up the the chain um, is our way of showing that we care and that we love. This episode is produced and brought to you by Social Wave. Social Wave is a strategic content marketing agency helping businesses grow revenue using video, podcasts, and SEO. Head on over to socialwave.com.au to find out more. Now back to the show. Well, I mean, speaking of food, um, yeah. and I think because um, we've been talking about it all episode. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but, um, Bodhi shutting down, right? Which is mm. obviously the elephant in the yep. room. Um, we, funnily enough, were at Bodhi literally the week before. Yeah. And, and we had no idea. We I didn't so tell shocked. you. I remember yeah. thinking of you actually when we were doing it going, <laughs> they don't know. Um, <laughs> these poor souls. So by then it was already happening because I know it was fairly, I wouldn't call it, it sudden, a, but it was. It was a pretty, it was a, it was a long time in the making, but it was a very quick decision. We were an incredibly strong business pre-COVID. And we, like every other hospitality business, we took a massive hit during Absolutely. that COVID period. We tried really hard to retain our entire team. You know, uh, those that could uh, go onto any government subsidies, we did that. But we still took a huge financial beating from that period. I think each lockdown closure probably cost us like half a million dollars each time, you know. Um, oh, and so that kind of adds up. But, but look, we bounced back incredibly quickly. So... Um, there was a lot of consumer confidence. I think we were an outdoor space. We were very COVID cautious yeah. in, in how we sort of treated the business. You know, we were rat testing all of our staff. Everybody had to wear masks even when they didn't have to wear masks mm -hmm. sort of thing. So I, I feel like we helped encourage a consumer confidence within our business. Um, and we were very lucky. We have a very loyal clientele that came back to us. So it wasn't COVID that kind of took us down really mm -hmm. at the end of the day. We knew that the site Cook and Philip, and we, we came into that site in 2000, so we've been there for 22 years. That site was in dire need of some investment uh, from the landlord, Sydney City Council. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, for whatever reason, uh, you know, they weren't in a position to do that and the site was just falling apart around our ears. Right. I mean, there was water coming down the walls. Mm -hmm. It was just terrible. Um, and we had been saying to them, we really need you guys to fix some of these issues. Our lease was coming up um, in 2022 anyway, mm -hmm. and we had made a commitment to financially invest and do, you know, a multi-million dollar fit out to the site mm -hmm. um, and to put in a state-of-the-art kitchen, restaurant, like it was going to be amazing. We'd worked with uh, Lucetti Carell, um, Rachel Lucetti, who's mm -hmm. an incredible hospitality designer. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's done some fantastic venues across Sydney. Um and uh, so we had, you know, the designs done and everything. And we were prepared to do this uh, if our landlord met us halfway mm. and financially committed to fixing some of the problems with the building itself. Uh, and they were not willing to do so. Mm. So, you know, we took it right up to the wire. We sort of we kept pushing it and pushing it. I mean, this was a negotiation that had been happening over two years. Mm. Uh, and we had said to them, just pre-COVID, this is what our intentions are. This is what we're going to do. We need to see that commitment from you guys. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll do it. Mm. Um, and then it just never came about okay. uh, sort of thing. So we had to make the really tough call of do we continue to do we continue and invest this money? Because they offered us 10 more years on the site, mm -hmm. which is great. Time. You know, um, but even if I invest that couple of million dollars into the site, if the site's falling down, I can't fix that stuff. That's structural. Yeah. That's the building, mm. you know. Um, and if you're not going to meet me part way, I can't in good conscience, throw good money after mm -hmm. bad money sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to need to find something else. I'm going to have to step away. And I think it was like a very sort of, I don't know, I'd like to sort of think the council and I, we have great, a great relationship, but we also have a tough relationship. It's like that girlfriend, boyfriend relationship <laughs> where you kind of, it's a love hate thing. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> when they're great, they're amazing. Mm. When you have the support of Sydney city council, they're fantastic. Um, but when you don't have their support, oh, it's a nightmare, mm -hmm. you know, to be a tenant. Um, sort of thing. And we had a lot of support from the top end of the council, you know, from the sitting councillors and the Lord Mayor and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but we really kind of butted heads within the property department mm. of how to get this stuff, whether it was budgeting or financing, getting these things sort of executed and done. And, you know, it's the council has so many different departments um, and our property happens to be a very complicated property with a lot of stakeholders in it. Mm -hmm 
Crown Land, Sydney City Council, the church oh. upstairs, um, her, you know, the heritage yeah. of the site, all of that sort of stuff. So trying to get any one thing done is mm-hmm. a logistical nightmare yeah. anyway. You know, changing a light fixture in the building, if I wanted to change the design of a light fixture, I mean, the steps I have to go through to get that done. Everywhere. I just want to go and do it, you know, sort of thing. It's, it's complicated. Uh, and I'm always happy to work within that framework. I work well within complex sort of frameworks. Mm-hmm. Um, but at, it got to the point where you've got to put your money where your mouth is. And unfortunately, they they just didn't meet us at the time that we needed them to. Mm-hmm. So I think where I say it's like this sort of complicated boyfriend-girlfriend relationship is I'd been threatening to leave for a while. Mm-hmm. And I think because we'd been there for 22 years, they're like, no. Playing <laughs> 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 Yeah, she'll be back. It's fine. They won't leave. They're, you know, they're so invested in this yeah. location. Everyone knows them as – you know, Bodhi in the park. This is this is as much their identity as it is our mm. identity. Um, and I think I just went, Do you know what? No, I'm out of here, sort mm. of thing. The complication came for me not in walking away from the business for me personally. The complication came in the responsibility to the staff, yeah. right, and to the family. So I still financially support family. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that layer to add into it. Um, and then I – you know, have these really deep connections and relationships. Kitty, my head Yamcha chef, has been with me for over 20 years. Mm. Wow. You know, so there's those kind of relationships. Brooke has been with me for over five years, the nighttime chef. You know, their migration, their visas, their homes. I I mean, you know, I've been involved in so many parts of their lives and vice versa. Mm. So it's not just a job. It's not just a work colleague relationship. It's a family relationship, Mm -hmm. even though they're not related to me by blood. Mm. Um, I have a a deep sense of responsibility towards those people. And I think if it hadn't been for them, I probably would have pulled the trigger on, on actually walking out of that site earlier. Right. Um, Because I had an opportunity to do that when COVID hit, Mm -hmm. you know, but I chose to stay to support the 50 people that worked for me because I I didn't want to leave them with financial security, insecurity, as well as, Mm. you know, global insecurity because of COVID, you know. God, can you imagine if I double whammy Mm. people? That would be awful. Mm. So I I had a commit. I committed to seeing it through COVID at least um, and and then sort of looking at the lay of the land and really sort of advocating and pushing council to sort of meet us part way. Mm. And then when I didn't get that from them, I was devastated. Not as much for myself, but more for the people that work with me because I'd let, I hadn't let them go, but I'd stood down 50 people, you know, in the first lockdown. I stood down 50 people in the second lockdown. Mm. And now I'm having to, you know, either yeah. stand down yeah. or let go 50 people again. I keep doing it. I was. Mm. Excuse my language. I was pissed. I, you know, at the time I was really pissed at the council because, like I said, it wasn't so much for me, but I was pissed for them. Like yeah. I don't want to put them through any unnecessary trauma. Mm. You know, people need security at a time like this mm. sort of thing. So, yeah, it was a tough decision to walk away. And I think my focus had been so much on the family and the team that one of the things I didn't recognize in closing the restaurant um, was the community impact mm-hmm. that it would have like that. The you know, reaction, right? The reaction was wasn't something I. I oh, it was incredible when yeah. we were watching it unfold. Yeah, it was. It was. I think it was within news breaking out. We just it, social media just exploded. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Like social it was, media went a little crazy. It was mm. crazy. You know. Yeah, that that last because I only gave them two weeks, right? Mm. Sort of thing. I mean, I, I wanted to meet my financial obligations as an employer. Um, and to help as many people as I could to find new roles and jobs if I wasn't going to stay with them. Um, but then I also had to close down the business, which is a complicated process when you've been involved in, for mm. 22 years in something uh, and how to navigate that. Mm. Um, and then also navigate what do we do next, you know, because everyone straight away is like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> what do you mean you're closing? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what's happening? There's Where something going? else going on. And I, I did say to my, my staff, look, as we had a couple of ideas on the boil at the time and I was like, you've just got to keep mum about everything because until I've signed something and I'm not going to sort of announce something and then it falls through. So please don't tell people because I'm, I knew people would ask the question. Mm-hmm. The staff were har- harassed and ha- people were oh. offering bribes. <laughs> to get the news. <laughs> to find out what we were going to do next. Uh-huh. Like we will pay you money if you tell us if you're reopening the oh restaurant and where it's going to reopen. Jesus. Sort of thing. 
Wow. So we just thought it was, and television stations were coming and asking for exclusive news oh, stories yeah. on what we would do next. So it generated a huge amount of interest that I wasn't expecting. Mm-hmm. I thought, oh, you know, I think when you're involved in a business and you're just in the day to day grind, it's very it, normalized, right? You know, yeah, mm-hmm. you're just in, you know, this is, I do this, mm-hmm. I do that, this is it's how I survive. Life. It's your life. You don't look outside of that sometimes. I knew the Bodhi had created a community of people, right? I always knew that was there. But I think I was so busy working that I myself was not involved as much in that community, although we created the space for that community and we helped connect a lot of people. Like I think I I met up with a bunch of influencers within the plant-based space and they were saying, this is the first time we met was at a Bodhi restaurant. And, you know, they had had their first meal together there and they had their regular meetups there and, you know, families had come together. People were coming to us and crying like Mm. I was so surprised Mm. I was like really it's just a restaurant (laughs) you know I know it wasn't to me but I was like to you should just be a restaurant no this is our parents came here I you know I came here I had every birthday with weddings here you know all major memories and celebrations had been at the restaurant so we were this you know really important part apparently Mm. I didn't recognize Mm. that at the time but we were this really important third person with you know you know how you I were a character on. we were a character Bodhi was a character Bodhi right? itself was yeah. a character mm-hmm. in so many people's lives in so many milestones that it played a far more important role that i recognized and it's such a unique restaurant and you know people often ask me like what's different why is Bodhi so different from other people's restaurants like an italian restaurant or a greek restaurant mm-hmm. or whatever and i say the difference is The Bodhi brings together like-minded people, right? And that's not something that happens at another restaurant. Mm. You go to a Greek restaurant, you might be this sort of person or that sort of person. Mm. But you come to Bodhi, you're probably somebody that has a passion for animals, health, wellness, fitness, um, spirituality. Like you're going to have some common ground with the person that's probably sitting at the next table. Yes. So that's something something that's different from other restaurants, I think. And so there's a huge sort of... Um, hole that has gets left from mm. from something that's been established for that many years. Not, I'm not trying to blow our own trumpet in any way because I think I was just as shocked by that. Well, I, I sort of liken the closure of Bodhi to very similar to um, like Marigold mm. um, shutting yeah, down, geez. or even when um, Golden Century went into Golden Century and Marigold into administration. It was like this: the community reaction was like these are institutions. Mm. Yeah, um, these are multi generational. Yeah, uh, you know, it, we all opened around the same time. We're all thirty. Oh, it was around the same we time. We are all okay. 30, 30 to forty year old businesses. Yep. Right. So that's that. You're right. They're, those are institutions. It's within the fabric of Sydney, so to speak, you know. And it's like you never second guess whether or not these places will disappear. They're always going to be there. Yeah. Mm. And you always think it's, it's going to be part of your life. Your kids are going to be enjoying it. Your parents, yeah. whoever. Yeah. And you're going to take everyone it's, there. It becomes shocking. I still, I mean, it's been, how long has it been? I mean, we closed in what? August? August, no. yeah. Was it August yeah. we closed? And we're now in October. Mm-hmm. Uh, I still get emails today. I like Just the other day, an American lady emailed said, I was coming just to see it, Bodhi, blah, 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 blah. You know, now you're not open. And what am I going to do? And I'm like, oh, I don't know what you're going to do. Like, I don't go somewhere else, yeah. you know. Um, but, but there is nowhere else to go. But there is nowhere else yeah. to go. Oh, I think there's, there's a couple of interesting little. A few. They're harder to get to. And it's not the same location or the same vibe mm. and the same place that has been around for 22 years. When you closed and announced, what was was that um, stripped down like? I know that you've spoken about having, you weren't selling it off to anyone or you wanted to take the fabric with you. Yeah. What was that journey like? Uh, yeah. A lot of people ask me, what did, what, you know, when you close, what are you going to do? Number one, what do you sell the business? Like even my uncles were calling me, why haven't you sold the business? <laughs> you should be selling the business. Are you stupid? You know, sort of thing. I'm like, I have a plan. Mm. You just have to be patient. Uh, in fact, one of my uncles, oh my gosh, this made me laugh. I have to tell you this story. One of my uncles, uh, and he had worked within this business, so he was quite connected to us. Um, he'd worked with my mum at one stage. And he said to me, so so why are you closing, number one? You make money. Why are you closing? That makes no <laughs> sense to me. You're, you've lost your mind. Number two, what stopped you? And I told him about our council problems. He's like, listen, the Asian way, you've got to find out who is the person that's blocking you. You need to find out where they live. You need to find out what they do. How You need to approach them personally. I'm like, we're not in the mafia, man. Like, the young child yeah. cartel. <laughs> right? Like, I was yeah. like, look, there are rules around this sort of thing and this is why this is happening. And he's like, no, 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 no. We don't do this. We're Chinese. We don't do this this way. I was like, oh, my God. It was one of the funniest conversations yeah. I've had. Um, I've said, I, so I told them they had to be patient. Just wait. I have a plan. We just, You just need to trust me one mm-hmm. more time. A lot of people ask me sort of what was that process? Do we, did we sell and all of that kind of stuff? No. Um, I wanted to – I built it. 
at least I built Cook and Phillip Park. Um, mm-hmm. What was the last one left that I built? Um, I want to take it apart mm-hmm. kind of thing. There was something cathartic about Mm. being able to pull everything down that we created Mm -hmm. and it was part of the mourning process and journey I think for me it was an important part of it stripping the site because every layer I took away I was also stripping a layer from myself Mm. Um, but I at the end when we closed that shop for the last time and I locked the doors and I looked around and it was this empty bare concrete shell right I I just remember standing there going oh, what could I rebuild here if I had the chance to redo things? Mm. And I think that's very relatable to how I feel about myself. I feel like I've stripped a lot of stuff from myself and now I'm at that, okay, this is exciting. Blank yeah. Now I get to build. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. the fun stuff, you know. Um, I get to recreate and I get to rebuild sort of thing. So, and I forget that because I went through that process um, – and that journey, not everybody else went through that process or journey. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I would I would be at that sort of last sort of period of stripping everything out and people would still be walking up to the restaurant going, what happened? Oh, where's it going? <laughs> What's going on? The like, non-social media people. Yeah, yeah. the non-social, the, no, the people who haven't read, you know, it in yeah. the newspaper and the Daily Mail and social media were coming and going, what's what's going on? Mm. And I'm like, oh, we're closed. Every day, every day that I clo- every day oh. that I stripped that shop out, and it took me weeks to strip that of shop course. out. Every day, people were coming to the door saying, "What is going on?" And so every day, I was having to retell the oh. story of, "We're closing for these reasons. Don't worry, stay in touch. We'll let you know what's happening mm-hmm. next. Go on my website." And they would want to share with me their experience and their journey oh. and what happened to them and what they loved about it. Mm-hmm. And then they would have to start asking me questions about what am I doing next and so forth. So um, I had to go through that process with them every day, and I was much further along in the morning process and I'm watching them sort of just come to this realization that we're closed and that that they start crying and sort of things. So, um, so yeah, it was a very interesting journey. It's big emotional burden. It's been very, it was very emotional in the beginning. And then I think it just got to the point where it was like, okay, too much emotion. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's it's too much. Mm -hmm. I need to Mm -hmm. stop and I need to, Mm -hmm. you know, I can't, I can't take on anymore. It was this tsunami of, of emotions and, and stuff. And I said, I had to just go, okay, I need to shut this down because I need to be in the do mode. I can't be, I can't wallow in that space mm. for very, very long. I have to continue to move forward. Mm. Well, you've been thing. saying that there's something in the works. Yeah. Is there anything that you can share with us or share with our listeners? Oh, how complicated. Um, there's nothing that I can share except to say that, Bodhi's closure is temporary, I guess is probably the best way to say it, which I think mm-hmm. is a good thing because at the time I, I don't think we were telling them anything even mm-hmm. about whether we were going to reopen. Um, so I can say that Bodhi's closure is temporary. Um, there will be more than just Bodhi and it is my hopes moving forward that um, it will allow me to share what we love and what we do and this sort of whole plant-based world with more people than what can fit in one restaurant. Oh, I'm so excited. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that help? That's yeah. exciting. <laughs> Does that not give it away but kind of give <laughs> yeah, it away? Yes. I don't yeah. know if that's, I think the you know, politicians will be proud with that. I'm yeah. trying to like <laughs> watch this space. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's funny because – I think people expect you to have something almost straight away to do and to go into. I'm like, just give me a minute. Yeah. Okay. Just, I need some time you to, need to breathe, breathe sort of thing. Because uh, even people that I work with are like, okay, so t- your clock's ticking. Like, where are we at with this? But we just want to make sure that whatever we do, that we're laying like really strong foundations first. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, the closure, as hard as it was, as sad as it is, um, has been one of the best gifts that I could give to myself in the mm-hmm. sense that it has – um, reignited that sort of flame and passion. Mm -hmm. It has opened that space for creativity again. I don't feel bogged down by stress and problems that I was constantly having to deal with. It's very liberating, isn't it? It's super liberating. So even before COVID, like I had started planning and investing in different areas and and, um, planning out new businesses that I had wanted to open still within the plant-based space. Uh, but each time I sort of took two steps forward, I felt like I got hit by something, whether it was COVID, whether the restaurant had problems or a change of management and mm-hmm. all of that sort of stuff. So every time I would take two steps forward, I felt like I'd have to take two steps back because I would, or one step back because I'd have to go back and focus on Bodhi. Or maybe at the time I didn't have the right people around me uh, to help me execute all of the different mm-hmm. things. Like when you're an entrepreneur, you know, 
the ideas are easy, yes. mm. but the people power that believe in what you do and can support you in achieving those things, that is the complicated part yeah. of the equation for someone like me, mm. you know, so, um, so I maybe didn't have all of the right people in place at the time to execute a lot of these things. Mm. Uh, and now that's, that's sort of that stage of now we're trying to surround ourselves with the people that can help us sort of do what we want to do next. Yeah. Mm. And I think also not forcing it as well. Mm. And I think if anything mm. that I learned when we were talking about this whole thing, because naturally my question was always like, well, what's next? Um, was this whole, I'm not rushing into it. I'm just going to see where it leads to us and yeah. um, it'll come. And, mm. um, you know, because we're in a go, go, go world, everyone just wants to fill that void. It leaves yeah, a vacuum and you've got to replace it with something, um, not to mention news and, you know, all the media yeah. and that sort of stuff, wanting something to talk about now that the news of Bodhi sort of sunk in and it's mm. closed as well. Um, but I guess, you know, sort of to wrap things up as well, uh, you know, I'm thinking again about the audience listening in. Um, particularly, I think, in the hospitality space, which is obviously you've spent your entire life in this yeah. business as well. I spent, you know, a decade in hospitality, albeit in hotels. So I have a very soft spot for the hospitality yeah. industry. Um, for someone who wants to pursue hospitality, Asian Australians who are listening to this as well, hospitality is sometimes perceived as a halfway house because mm. it's like a job that I do whilst I study and all that sort of stuff. But I, I feel like there's this sort of next generation and we're already seeing it of um, Asian Australians who are really using hospitality as an industry to really put their footprint and their stamp on it. So do you have like any advice, any guidance around what they could think about when it comes to, you know, either doing it like as a business hmm. themselves or just working in hospitality as well. So many things to kind of delve into on this just one topic. You know, <laughs> I'm very passionate about hospitality uh, and I have mixed emotions about certain things about hospitality. One of my frustrations, but I'm very understanding about it, but one of my frustrations is when I see um, other people do Asian better then the Asians are doing it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I don't like that. I, mm -hmm. I don't know why. And I know I shouldn't probably feel this way because no one owns any one thing, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a part of me that's like, you know, why have we got, and I, I don't know if this is going to end up coming out a little controversial, but why have we um, got people who don't really have links or ties to our culture um, creating food and being able to create these amazing spaces mm -hmm. and create, you know, great dishes maybe not quite with the same flavors mm. and subtleties that we do ourselves, mm. um, you know, and they're super celebrated within the hospitality space. Uh, and I'm not going to pull any names out in particular. I, you know, each, everybody has a right to do anything. If I want to go and do Italian food, I should be able to go and do mm -hmm. Italian food. However, I think where I feel a little complicated and conflicted on this issue is I'm tired of seeing um, other people do well in the space that I think we should be doing well in ourselves yeah right mm. uh, there's a very common misconception that asian food should be cheap mm -hmm. right the only reason asian food is cheap is because they're probably paying under the table or mm -hmm. they're paying them less than what they deserve mm. at the end of the day it's like i said it's a deep subject yep. you know for me anyway uh, within the industry mm. um so we don't celebrate ourselves enough we don't appreciate enough well if anything we as Asians actually do it to ourselves. Oh, 100%. We're like, why does a bun me cost $10? Yeah. And we're complaining Asians about it. Asians. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? You know, there's rent, inflation, everything. Ingredients go up. And it's, yeah. it's fr I can, I, I resonate with you because um, we're yeah. actually talking to some other Asian Australian restaurateurs who we know are very passionate about trying to change that thinking yeah. around it. That Asian food, why should Asian food just be considered cheap, right? It so, should, um, it shouldn't. Look, of course. You can have cheaper Asian food if it's frozen, if it's, you know, your B or C grade stock that you've gotten mm. that's like the leftovers. They're painting from, with all the same brush, yeah, you know. From, yeah. from Flemington Markets, yeah. you know, it's yeah. not going to be a, your grade A shiitake mushrooms and all of the rest of it, right? But definitely when you are producing good quality food and you are using great ingredients, that should be appreciated, um, number one. Number two, the skills that it takes, you know, maybe Asians haven't in the past been as good as uh, other races or cultures at storytelling their mm. own, um, mm. you know, stories. And perhaps that's played a little bit into it. Uh, but definitely, you know, we need to celebrate the skills that it takes, the toughness, the tenacity. Um, in Yamcha, let's take Yamcha as an example. There's no Yamcha cookbooks out there. You can't go to Yamcha culinary school. 
you know, each of these dishes, each of these recipes, each of these folds within every single single dumpling has to be taught through trial, error, experience, mentorship, and is passed down from generation to generation from Sifu Master Chef down. Mm -hmm. You can't go and learn this stuff at some school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we really need to understand that 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 has to be celebrated, appreciated, and that costs money as well. Yum Cha is probably the one, the one category that they actually know their worth a little bit. Yum Cha mm. chefs themselves are probably mm. one of the few chefs that would say they know their worth a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, but I, I, I would like to see more people come through the hospitality industry and celebrate their own cultures. I talk about to a lot of different people, especially refugees and immigrants, about assimilation. Uh, assimilation is a very key part to succeeding in my story and I think in many other people's story. And it's often why success stories take generations because sometimes, um, you know, let's say our parents or grandparents or whatever come over here, they don't necessarily assimilate. They tend to stick to their own cultural comfort zone, mm. you know, so they'll move into areas. And, and maybe that was the the luck of the draw for me because I had, you know, our family were forced to assimilate because we were in a very white bread sort yeah. of North Shore area. Um, assimilation is important, but there's two parts to assimilation. The first part, you must assimilate because your finances, the economy, you know, you're selling to Australians, right? So mm -hmm. you've got to understand it to know what they want and how they want it and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so that's one reason why assimilation is important. But the second part that's important is you must not lose your cultural identity whilst you are assimilating, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what makes you unique mm -hmm. to the culture that you are actually yeah. now currently living in. I think when we were able to bring sort of the sensibility of our Asian food and, and the beauty of it and combine that with Western service, and style, that's when Bodhi kind of started to open right. up and find success. Yeah. Right. I don't think my family could ever sort of achieve that because they didn't know how to blend those two things together. Mm. So assimilate, assimilate as quickly as possible. Take the best from the East, take the best from the West, put it together, and you're going to have a fantastic product sort mm. of thing. Uh, and you'll be able to charge the kind of prices uh, that I think people are going to need to survive in that top end of hospitality or that mid range to top end of hospitality that we sat in yes. sort of thing, you know, a takeaway shop's going to be very, very different. Mm. Um, but if you want to do well at my end of the market in hospitality, you need to bring the best from both Definitely. sides sort Absolutely. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. you got to present the food beautifully yeah. with a Western eye, mm. yes. but you have to have the, the true authentic taste of the Asian side. Yeah. Like I also go to other restaurants and, and it's a it's a Western chef and they never quite get – some of them are good, mm. but they never quite get it's those authentic flavors. It's not just It's not just techniques no. as well. There's, the a lot of, there's a lot of soul to it. It's yeah. soul and speaking food. of soul, I even think of, um, you know, even right now in Sydney, like soul dining, mm. which, um, you know, young next generation of Korean chefs. Yeah. Um, and I feel like Korean culture, just as an example, is one that um, out of all the Asian um, flavors – have been a bit more uncompromising in terms of like sticking to their guns about mm. their flavor, right? The Koreans seem to yes. do that quite well. Mm. Um, and then to, you know, we're already seeing sort of um, a lot more sort of that East and West melded together and doing some really like fantastic stuff because naturally we're all foodies and we yep. keep up to date with mm. what's happening as well. So I, I totally agree with you. And I think there's a wedge available now that, um, you know, particularly the next generation who wants to get into hospitality should think about exactly what you were speaking about, which is don't, don't run the next takeaway shop, mm. yeah. but think about, um, you know, outside of just doing a great business and a great restaurant, for example, is like, how do you sort of um, help with, you know, our, our community and our culture. Yeah. I mean, you know, the structure, the systems, the stylings, I love taking that from the Western side of things and the flavor, the authenticity, all of that sort of stuff, mm. you know, bringing that in from the Asian side of things. There needs to be more young people looking at hospitality, like I, like you said, not as a side gig, yep. you know, and we're just, we're just not, we've never really been that country, you know, previously, like I was recently traveling in the States and, you know, I had waiters or servers, as I like to call them over there, you know, um, who were looking after us. And they were in their 50s. We don't really see that as much in Australia. Mm, it's not like, a career. That's true. It's not a career, mm. you know. Um, and I asked them, you know, I often ask them, like, 
you know, is this a career for you or is this a side gig? And they go, no, this is my career. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I've worked in the hospitality industry for 20 years. Uh, and, you know, they get paid and they get tips on top of that. That's another thing. We're not a tipping culture here mm. in Australia as right. much. And interestingly, when I had worked with my mum's businesses, nobody tipped. But when I sort of started to do it in a more Western way, we started yes. to see tips coming in, yeah. which I thought was interesting as well. Yeah. Um, so, yes, you know, pay structures, all of those kind of things are really important to put in place under the, that sort of Western Australian way and then bring in that sort of Asian stuff. Yeah. I also think the customer or the demographic has changed as well because, like you said, the younger generation has come through. And because we do have these different cultures that tie us together into the mm -hmm. one within a Western culture, we can appreciate that – the Western service and the Western qualities with the Asian flavor as well. And it just fits into this new third culture. But also we don't, we do tie, we don't tie our um, evaluation or our critique of uh, how good a restaurant is and the quality of food based on price, which I think our parents have a tendency to do. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's a generational thing. That's a, mm, that's a whole you know. thing. And, and I feel like this is probably going to be like a part two if we can sort yeah. of unpack yeah. all of this. But it's like, you know, talking to Davey actually all the time, his parents actually just – judge the quality of the food based on mm. how much it costs. Mm -hmm. 100%. You know, and, and that and quantity. affects that affects restaurants. Like yeah. I, I had a couple of favorite yum cha restaurants out in the suburbs that I would go to and I remember the, when the quality of the food changed. Like yum cha dumplings and the like let's take a chasu bao for example, right? Mm. It used to be quite like a medium size or petite. I like it quite delicate and petite and pretty and and a little bit more craftsmanship and work has gone into it. Mm -hmm. Still a little rustic, but, you know, mm -hmm. th there's a, a size for me that works. And I started noticing in this yum chai restaurant, the, the buns and dumplings were getting bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. I was like, what's going on here? But the quality was also reducing. Mm -hmm. But that was because of the demand of the older generation. Oh, right. Yeah. And I spoke to the restaurant owner, but I said, you know, it's the same chef, same yum cha. I knew who the yum cha chef was. Mm -hmm. So I was like, what's happened? You know, have you changed chefs? Is he still working here? He's like, no, he's still working. I'm like, what's going on with the food? He's like, well, you know, they, they want it to be cheaper. So mm. we make it bigger now. Mm. I said, don't fall. I said to him, don't fall into that trap. Please, please, please don't fall into that trap. And he said, no, you know, I've got to meet the demand of my older clientele and so forth. I said, mm. and I thought to myself, you're making a big mistake. And I told him that. I said, I think you're making a big mistake. And I think that the quality of your food is going down. And if you don't fix it, your business is going mm. to have Yeah, you're sowing your own seed, mm. I think, in a lot and of ways, did. right? Yeah, he financially, oh, and it did happen. Yeah. Did. They financially got into a lot of trouble. Well, there you go. Mm. Kind of thing. He should have stuck to his guns and done, you know, the yeah. food the way the food was meant to be. Yeah. And I understand he would have lost some of that older clientele, but it would have he would have kept Pay a whole new clientele you. coming yeah. in. And that's been also a, a big sort of thread of everything that I've, I've tried to do within the restaurant is to really always try, try and stay true to the quality and the standards and the belief of, you know, this is what it is and this is what it's worth and this is how it should be made sort of thing. Um, and even when people would say, oh, you know, how, how come Bodhi is so expensive? You know, it's just vegetables. You're charging too much money. I'm like, okay, but you do realize I still have to pay – you know, the chefs really, really well. I, you know, your bartender is paid right. a ward or above, you know, so we look after our staff and our mm -hmm. team because we understand the value of them to our business. We don't mm -hmm. undercut and undermine that. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you know, this is what the goods cost. And if you are happy to pay it or you can afford it, great. And if you can't and you want to do cheaper food that's frozen, go to Newtown yeah. or somewhere else that that is, you know, not calling out Newtown here. <laughs> get in trouble for that. Um, but go somewhere else with a smaller premise that, you yeah. know, is um, – Different experience. Is, is, it's a different experience. You can't compare Bodhi – and people would do it. They would compare us to um, – like a buffet service. I'm like, you can't compare us mm. to a buffet service. We, it's a full service restaurant. I don't think there's any comparison to Bodhi, yeah. to be honest. No, no but yeah. customers would write to would. me and say, but I went to, you know, this restaurant and yeah. they serve vegetarian food buffet and I only paid this much. And I'm like, well, then go there. That's fine. But <laughs> yeah. I'm going to stick to doing what I do. Mm -hmm. And But very quickly, like I would often raise my prices – you know, because I have a formula. Mm. Right? I was never there to make huge amounts of money. Mm -hmm. There's a, a set formula for me on how I feel like the business needs to work financially. And if there is more money left over, I don't keep that for myself. It goes into savings so we can renovate and mm. we can, you know, mm -hmm. expand and all of that. It's always reinvested back into the company. You know, I, I, whilst not trained as a chef or anything like that, I think if I had another career pathway, really? I probably would have went into actually learning don't do it. Know, culinary. <laughs> I know, I know it's brutal because, you know, I, I – even when I was working in hotels, you know, I was working in, um, you know, F&B a fair bit, but mm. sort of front of house and 
you just see just how brutal the industry mm. is in general. Yeah, a lot of people come to me and say, I want to open a restaurant or a bar or a cafe. I mean, the first thing I always say, don't do it. Mm. Don't do it. You are going to sacrifice everything in your life yep. to go into this industry. Mm. It is one of the toughest, most grueling, hard mm. industries to be involved in. Um, and there's so many stories of failure in this industry. In most businesses don't, don't get to year five, let alone, you know, 30 years or whatever. So I often say, don't do it if you don't have to do it. Like, mm -hmm. what else have you, have you got a degree? What else can you do? You know, sort of thing. Um, but then if I really see, truly see that passion and that fire, I go, okay, there's no talking this person out yeah. of this. All right, this is definitely your mm. yep. your your passion in your bag. Then I will say, okay, well, if you're going to do it, this is what you need to understand, right? It's going to take everything out of right. you, but it will it will be one of the hardest things you'll have ever done in your life. But it will also be one of the most rewarding things mm. if you allow it to be and if you succeed. Mm. But remember, there's a really small chance of success. Yeah. Um, and I love working with or mentoring or talking to people that are coming up into the industry and sort of sharing my experience at least because I hope mm. that by hearing that um, in those moments when they are like hang on I can't do this or what am I doing or I'm about to lose everything that they'll sort of remember I, you know I went through this as well but look we turned this around and we found success in this and this is what we did to sort of do that so here's a, a footpath that you can follow mm. yeah, kind I, of thing I think that's so valuable um, just to kind of wrap things up where can people find more information about where Bodhi is going in the future and any updates in your life as well so Bodhi still has its website going, which is bodhirestaurant.com.au. So you can always find up-to-date restaurant information on there. Um, for my stuff, so I'm on heavenly, H-E-A-V-E-N-L-E-I-G-H.com.au. So I have my own website there. And that's where you can kind of follow more of my personal stuff um, as well as some restaurant updates sort of thing. But it's more plant-based lifestyle. I do a lot of work with other brands and collaborations and so forth. Um, and so I'm going to – I'm I meant to start documenting more of this closure journey over mm -hmm. the last few weeks, but we were traveling and stuff. And I went, no, do you know what? I'm actually just not going to do anything. It. I'm yeah. just going to enjoy this closure. Mm -hmm. um, so now I've started to put it in writing and started documenting yeah. and pulling all the photos of the journey. So I will start sharing all of that stuff on social media and, and so forth. Um, but I also always, always tell people, write to me, mm -hmm. you know, like don't feel like you're just going to read a blog or whatever that I do or watch me on social media. Like message me, ask me if you can't put a recipe together and you're not sure, like send me a message going, what's the coconut cream that you use for this one? <laughs> I will answer you, you know, like tell me what's going on in your lives. This is the opportunity for me to connect to that community. And so I welcome, you know, I'm going to regret this, aren't I? But I welcome, <laughs> you know, correspondence <laughs> from mm. people and hearing from people about themselves and what they're going through and stuff like that. It's it's, it's definitely it has to be a two-way street here, you know. So mm. And continue to watch me on Channel 7 and Channel 10. Yeah. That's the other thing. Amazing. Great. Thanks so much for coming on to the podcast today. We're really excited to see what comes in the future. But thank you so much for your time. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you. Bit oh of therapy goodness. as well. Yeah, I know. Great, I know. We'll have to do another episode. Yeah. Absolutely. Part two. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Level Asian podcast. Make sure you subscribe and leave us a five-star review if you enjoyed the episode. And why not share it with friends and family who might enjoy it too? Also, make sure you head over to levelasianpodcast.com to join our email list and to receive the latest updates and get notified when the next episode drops. If you know a great guest we should feature, email us at contact at levelasianpodcast.com or DM us on our socials in the show notes. Catch you on the next episode.